Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Professional Development Corps' mock peer review looking into scenarios today. My name is Christian Burrish. I'm the Professional Development Corps coordinator, and it's my job to oversee today's events and take care of IT issues as they do come up. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Savannah Macias Dorty, and I'm the core coordinator for the pilot projects program of from the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks. I will be the scientific review officer today, or SRO. It's my role to arrange the logistics of the peer review, recruit and prepare reviewers, and ensure NIH regulations and procedures are followed during the peer review. Following the peer review, I'll assemble the summary statements for each applicant. Hi, everyone. I am not Don Sens. I am Jamie Scholl. I'm the Dakota Navigator at the University of South Dakota in Vermilion. I will be the chair. It's my role to introduce applications and reviewers and guide the discussion to ensure it stays on topic. I will conclude and summarize each discussion and record the assigned reviewers and panel's final scores. Hi, my name is Miranda Lighthizer. I am a research project manager with Sanford. Um, I will be the NIH program officer today. As the program officer, I wrote the RFA for the applications that will be reviewed today. Um, the SRO allows the program officer to give a description of the RFA before the review and answer any questions about the RFA that arise during the review. I will also observe and take notes on this discussion. And in today's performance, the role of reviewer one will be played by me. Uh, my name is Lee Ba. I'm the director for the Professional Development Corps and an associate professor in cognitive neuroscience at uh, the Sanford School of Medicine at the University of South Dakota. Hello, I'll be reviewer number two today. My name is Paola Vermeer, and I'm an associate scientist here at Sanford Research, and I work on cancer biology. And I'll also be reviewer number three today. Hello, I'm, I will be reviewer number four. I'm Estelle Leclerc. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at NDSU. Hi, and uh, my name is Cassie Geary, and I'm a project manager at Stanford Health in Sioux Falls, and I will be reviewer number five. Good morning, everyone. I'll be reviewer number six. Uh, my name is Kent Ripplinger. I am the database navigator for the Dakota, and I am from the University of North Dakota. Good morning. I will be reviewer number seven. My name is Mark Williamson. I'm on a research assistant professor in the population health department and then the core, co core coordinator for the biostats core at the University of North Dakota. Good morning. My name is Sue Thompson. I'm the coordinator for the Community Engagement Outreach Corps of the Dakota, um, located at the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, and I am reviewer eight. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nikki Voigt. I'm the admin core coordinator at the University of North Dakota, and I'll be reviewer number nine. So just to go over today's parameters, this is a mock study section that doesn't involve the discussion of real applications. They're all fictitious. The discussions are abbreviated in the interest of time, so review criteria such as investigators and institutions won't be discussed today. The purpose of today's training is to give you an idea of what happens at study sections featuring common scenarios that often arise. Today, we'll cover three fictitious applications, and each application will have three assigned reviewers. Feel free to ask questions when we open the floor to Q&A after the SRO explains the meeting process. And if you're unable to ask your question at this time, reach out to me at Christian.burish at usd.edu. I'll put my email in the chat momentarily and we'll find the answer for you. So now I'll go ahead and summarize the scope and sequence of events for each application that we'll review. The SRO asks the NIH program officer to summarize the request for applications or RFA, and the NIH program officer summarizes the RFA. The chair will take control of the meeting and introduce the application and assigned reviewers. 
the assigned reviewers give preliminary overall scores ranging from one to nine, with a score of one being the highest score possible and a score of nine being the lowest score possible. Reviewer one, also known as the reader, will give a brief overview of the application describing the, science, the specific aims and the strengths and weaknesses of the application by the following criteria, significance, innovation, and approach. Then reviewer two, also known as the primary reviewer, and reviewer three, also known as the secondary reviewer, will describe the strengths and weaknesses of the application by the same criteria, significance, innovation, and approach. Reviewer two and reviewer three can add comments that may have been left out and or disagree with the preceding reviewers. They may also concur with the preceding reviewers to avoid redundancy. After the assigned reviewers speak, the discussion opens to all reviewers on the panel. At this point, reviewers can ask questions to seek clarification from the three assigned reviewers and provide information on the research field that the application covers. As the discussion winds down, the chair will summarize the discussion based on score driving criteria and noting areas of consensus and differences of opinion. The assigned reviewers will give their final impact scores and indicate the range that these scores occupy. For example, if the highest score given by an assigned reviewer is a two and the lowest final score given by another reviewer is a five, then the range is between two and five. The chair will ask anyone on the panel the chair will ask if anyone on the panel will be scoring outside of that range. If so, the chair will ask the reviewers scoring outside the range to raise their hands to indicate this to the SRO and chair so it can be noted on the summary statement. And that concludes the peer review process for a single application. All right, time for some Q&A over scoring. If you have any questions, uh, we'll take them at this time. So not a question, um, Christian, but just uh, one point, and uh, I tuned out for a second there, so I'm not sure if this came up, but just in case it didn't, um, what we're going to be describing today is when applications actually make it to being discussed. Um, so the process for NIH, as many of you may or may not be aware, is that um, many applications are triaged. So they initially go out for review. Uh, assigned reviewers provide their scores. If an application doesn't look like it's going to be competitive, typically in the bottom half, it is usually not discussed unless it's part of a special mechanism or there's only a few of that type of grant. Um, and uh, in the case that it's not discussed, none of this happens. All that you get as an applicant is the summary statement that is um, provided by the um, reviewers of your grant and um, a little bit of a summary by the um, NIH staff. So um, what we're going over are for those applications that have already been deemed meritorious enough to be discussed by the whole panel. Um, so just wanted to make that clear um, as people you know get their NIH grants out there. If you're not familiar with this, you may wonder, well, what the heck does not discussed means? That's what not discussed means. Thank you for the addition, Dr. Bob. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, we'll be moving on. We have a legal notice from the SRO before we get started. So we need to cover a few legal issues before we begin this peer review. Everything discussed in this room must stay in this room. Don't go discussing this review with your colleagues, collaborators, co-investigators, or even someone across the hall from you at your home institution. If you have a conflict of interest, it must be identified ahead of time. If anyone here has conflict of interest with the, any application being discussed today, we'll have that person leave the room for the duration of the discussion. We also ask that you don't discuss applications previously discussed or applications yet to be discussed because others may be in conflict with those applications. If you suspect scientific misconduct on the part of the applicant, the reviewer should privately contact the SRO, preferably before the review commences. We emphasize that applicants get the benefit of the doubt in accusations of scientific misconduct. Do any reviewers have any questions? Hi, this is reviewer one, um, Lee. 
Uh, I have a question. So what is the cutoff for funding? That is, can you tell me what score I should give an application if I want to make sure that it gets funded? Stop the review. So our first question is this. Should the SRO let reviewers know what score to give if they want the application to be funded? I'll send a poll out and we'll talk about it. Okay, and our results come back. 92% say no, 8% say yes. Um, so, Chair, what's the answer? So, in a review meeting, we do not discuss the F word funding. We are here to assess the score of the science and score the scientific and technical merit of the applications, and we do not make funding decisions. This is very important. At second level of review, the advisory council for each institute considers recommendations and scores in light of the institute goal and priorities to make funding decisions. The two stages of review are a cornerstone of the NIH peer review system. So before we start the review, I would like to ask the program officer if they would like to make a few comments about the RFA since they were involved in writing the RFA. Yeah, <clears throat> so we will be reviewing applications from, from an RFA from NIDA, N-I-D-A, <clears throat> named Discovery of Novel Treatments for Opioid Use Disorders. The RFA is meant to support research on novel therapies that have not been approved for clinical use. The application can focus on pharmacological, behavioral, or alternative treatments. At NIDA, we decided to allow a very broad range of applications, so this RFA is clinical trial optional. That means that the RFA will accept applications that either involve or do not involve clinical trials. When presenting your evaluation, please focus your discussion on the score driving issues, which are significance, innovation, and approach. Um, are any of the reviewers in conflict? Our first application is from Jane Johnson, an early stage investigator. The title of the application is IGFI as a potential treatment for opioid use disorders. The assigned reviewers are Lee Baugh, Paola Vermeer, and Mohi Quadir. Please give your preliminary impact scores. One. Dr. Vermeer. Two. Three. All right. So um, I thought this was a great application that proposes to leverage some recent and really exciting discoveries with insulin-like growth factor, um, also known as IGF-1, mostly to see if it can be used for treatment for opioid use disorder. The first two aims involve biochemistry and pharmacology experiments to develop IGF-1 as a therapeutic. And the third aim will examine the effects of IGF-1 in preclinical studies. I'm really excited about the potential impact of this study. The application clearly addresses the rigor of the prior research by pointing out the strengths and the weaknesses of the published research that support this project. In addition, the use of both male and female rodents in an animal model of AIM-3 is a uh, huge strength. The approach section is detailed and all of the necessary information needed to assess the experiment is clearly presented. Therefore, the scientific rigor is strong as well. The application is highly innovative and the environment is stellar. I had some concerns with the design of one of the aims, but these concerns are minor. I also gave the PI the benefit of the doubt on the strength of her publication record because she's an early stage investigator. That's all that I have. All right. I agree with the first reviewer's comments, so I won't repeat all the strengths that she has listed. 
I just want to add that I'm very impressed that all the expertise required for the aims proposed, such as biochemistry and pharmacology, is well represented on the research team. This increases my confidence that the PI will be able to accomplish the aims. Uh, well, of course, my focus was on the preclinical and behavioral tests in AIM-3. This aspect of the application has some flaws in design. I personally do not agree with the control the PI chose. For the one aim, this is an issue, but hearing the comments from the other reviewers on potential impact of research, I will adjust my final score so it reflects the whole application. Now that we've heard from our assigned reviewers, the discussion is now open to the rest of the panel. So I'm reviewer four and I have a question. Um, I have a question regarding the pharmacology expertise. Does the applicant have expertise working with this specific load factor because it can be tricky to work with. Um, I am the program officer. Can I please address that the issue that issue since I have been advising the applicant on this application? Stop the review. So here's your second polling question. Uh, so can the program officer jump into the conversation to answer this question? Is that of a benefit to the panel? I'll release another poll. Right, a majority say uh, no. So Chair, what is the answer? Okay, so thank you for asking, but no, this would not be appropriate. Program staff are here to observe the discussion and they can answer general questions about the RFA if the SRO finds it appropriate, but they should not be involved in the discussion of a specific application. It's very important that we keep it at two levels of the two levels of peer review separate. So we'll get back to the review now. So in response to the question I raised about the expertise, there is a co-investigator with extensive experience with insulin-like growth factor. So I believe that that area is covered. Okay, so to summarize, the goal of this experiment is to explore the potential of IGF-1 to be used as a therapy for opioid use disorder. The application addresses a clear need in the field and the reviewers agreed that the potential impact was high. Both rigor of the prior research as well as scientific rigor have been addressed. There was some con concern about the control selected for the behavioral studies in AIM-3, but this was considered a minor point. We are now ready to hear the final scores. Can we start with reviewer one? I'll stay at a one. I'll stay at a two. I'll stay at a three. So the range of scores is one to three. Um, does anyone on the panel intend to score outside of this range? Okay, well, all reviewers submit their final scores. All right, time for some Q&A. If uh, anyone has any questions regarding those uh, first scenarios, we'd be glad to hear them at this time. If we don't have any questions, let's just dive right into application number two. Okay, so when presenting your evaluation, please focus your discussion on the score driving issues, significance, innovation, and approach. Are there any reviewers in conflict? Okay, our second and final application is from Tom Wilson. The title of the application is Novel Art Alternative Treatments for Opioid Use. The assigned reviewers are Estelle Leclerc, Cassie Gary, and Kent Merflinger. Please give your preliminary impact scores. I gave a score of two. I give a score of two. And I give a score of a one. So I'm going to give you a summary of this application. So this application proposed to test alternative treatment, specifically plant extract as a novel form of treatment for opioid use disorders. The PI is a renowned medicinal chemist who has experience developing plant-based medications. 
The rigor of the prior research is addressed based on the review of the literature in this field. A weakness uh, is noted is that it does not have access to the plant extract that they propose to use. And it does not appear that they will have access anytime soon. So overall, even though so, there are a number of weaknesses with the approach and the level of innovation is marginal at best, the PI has a good working knowledge in the field that I'm sure it can figure out how to solve any potential design flow and overcome any technical challenges as the study gets underway. Overall, I like I really like the application and I'm really confident that the PIs of the PI's ability to get the job done. I agree that the PI is very talented, but he hasn't published in the past two years and maybe the past decade or so. In addition, I'm not sure they have the resources and personnel to conduct the experiments. So I have another concern about novelty that the plant-based medication, they're now the novelty is low because they are similar to the ones that are already being tested in clinical studies. Therefore, for me, the innovation is low, but overall, I agree with the first reviewer. The PI is very well known. When I was in graduate school, he was really well published, but not so much lately. I have another concern, the approach will utilize animal models, and in the application, they, are, they will only be using male mice. So however, I do not agree with the rationale for excluding female mice in the design, and I have a question for the SRO. Should this affect my score? Yes, good question. So according to the guidelines for rigor and re reproducibility, sex as a biological variable should be addressed in the approach section of the application. The PI will not be using both sexes, whether that's human subjects or vertebrate animals. They need to provide a justification and this issue can affect the score. Well, in that case, I consider this another weakness with the application. Okay, we can open the discussion to the entire panel. So I have a question. I'm not one of the assigned reviewers and I did not read the application. Can I comment on the discussion? All right, stop the review. Our next polling question, can this reviewer participate in the discussion if they have not read the application? I'm gonna launch another poll and uh, we'll talk about it. Right, we release the results, and a majority say yes, and a quarter say no. So, Chair, what's the answer? Um, yes, so anyone who is not in conflict with an application can participate in the discussion. Since everyone will be submitting final scores, you can also participate in the discussion. So only the assigned reviewers are required to read the application. As you know, all of the other reviewers not in conflict have access to the application. They sometimes do have conflict, but anyone who is not in conflict can participate in the discussion. Okay, so I just want to say that I'm hearing a number of weaknesses, lack of access to the compound, little current work by the PI, and failure to address sex as a biological variable. That seems inconsistent with the scores and the high impact range that the assigned reviewers gave. Perhaps the assigned reviewers could speak a little more about, about that, how they came up with these scores. May the assigned reviewers address this question? Yes, I think you have a, a, a valid point. The application does have issues in the research plan and the PI does not has not done a good job in discussing potential pitfalls and giving alternative approaches. After hearing additional weaknesses from the other reviewers, and realizing that my score might not reflect the number of weaknesses, I think I'm going to adjust my score. I agree with the first reviewer. I will also recalibrate my scoring. This is my first meeting, so I'm still calibrating my scores. I now see there are a number of weaknesses, so I will adjust my score accordingly. So 
So it sounds like assigned reviewers are going to be adjusting their score and um, I would like the final scores from the assigned reviewers. I will give a three. I will give a four. I will give a four. Okay, so we have a range from three to four. Will the anyone on the panel intend to score outside of this range? This is Lee. I'll uh, score outside of the range. Um, based on those comments, it sounds like this is a, a marginal application at best. Okay, will all reviewers submit their final scores? All right, another application down, just one more to go. Does anyone have any questions? We have answers. So not a question, uh, but since we have plenty of time, uh, I'll provide some context to this one as well. So um, it may sound kind of weird that reviewers change their scores so much in the review process, um, but I've seen this on every study section I've been on. There's at least one application where all three reviewers say, oh, I give it a two or a three, and then they give this long list of problems with the grant. And one of the non-assigned reviewers chimes up and says, wait a minute, you guys are giving some pretty big uh, problems with this grant. Are you sure you want to score it like that? And then everyone recalibrates. Um, so, you know, we'd like to think that this is a process that is, by the time a grant gets to being scored, um, is all ironed out and everything's going to go smoothly. Um, it, it, it isn't necessarily. And oftentimes you do have people, you know, voting outside of the range and um, really adjusting their scores after that discussion, which is why the panel discussion is such an important part of the review process. Uh, thanks for the uh, addition, Dr. Vaught. Um, unless we have other questions, let's press on to the third and final application of the day. Okay, <clears throat> reviewer number seven here. I actually just realized that I provided a reagent to the PI for this application. I only charged him for the shipping of the reagent and make this reagent available to any investigator upon request. Would this put me in conflict with this application? All right, stop this review. Uh, our fourth polling question is, is this reviewer in conflict with the application if he provided the reagent to the investigator at cost? So I'll send out the poll and we'll talk about it. All right, so we have um, kind of a split. Uh, just over half say no, under a quarter say yes, and another quarter is uncertain. So chair, what's the answer? Thank you. That was a very good question. This is a bit of a nuanced part of review. So if you're providing a reagent and only charging for shipping, it is not a conflict as long as it is something that you would provide to any researcher. And most importantly, that you're not engaged in collaboration in any other way with the PI. Okay, thank you for that clarification. In that case, I am not in conflict, but I just wanted to be sure. Thanks. So the next application is from George McPhee, and the title is A Clinical Trial Examining Cognitive Behavior Behavioral Therapy for Opioid Use Disorder. The assigned reviewers are Mark Williamson, Sue Thompson, and Nikki Voigt. Can the assigned reviewers please give their preliminary scores? I will give this a three. I will give this a six. I will give this a three. Okay, reviewer seven, you may start your review. I'd be glad to. This application proposes what I consider to be a highly novel use of cognitive behavioral therapy to treat opioid use disorders. In the design of this study, cognitive behavioral therapy or a sham treatment will be administrated to participants at a single clinical site who meet the DSM-5 criteria for opiate use disorder. The participants will have follow-up interviews at six months and one year to assess opioid use. There have been other studies that have examined the effects of this application on opioid use,
but this application proposes a novel treatment plan that is based on a recent paper that has some exciting results. The paper indicates that longer CBT sessions, so that's cognitive behavioral therapy sessions, they might have longer lasting effects on opioid use. The application is clearly written and the PI is a leader in the field. All the review criteria in the RFA that are specific to clinical trials have been addressed and the study protocol has been included and that is clearly written. The study timeline is feasible and well justified. Challenges and proposed solutions are adequately discussed. The experiments are sufficiently powered including detection of sex-based differences. Now, my score would have been better, but I have some concerns with the control sham procedure that they will be using. I thought they could have included more information on the training of personnel at the clinical site. Right. So I agree with most of the strengths and weaknesses given by the primary reviewer. However, I gave a less favorable score because I believe the investigators have misinterpreted the results from the key paper that was cited. My concern deals with the rigor of the prior research. The investigators interpret the results to show that the new treatment has a longer lasting effect. However, I do not agree with this interpretation. Therefore, this leads to a flawed hypothesis because I do not think that the new treatment procedure will have any added benefit. This was a major score driving issue for my review. Yes, I agree with the first reviewer but I think I'd have to disagree with the comments of the second reviewer. I actually believe the rigor of the prior research is solid. All right, now that we've heard from the assigned reviewers, the discussion is open to the rest of the panel. Okay, so I wasn't an assigned reviewer for this application. I did go ahead and read it out of curiosity. I actually agree with Sue. The intellectual foundation of this application is extraordinarily weak. The PI did not understand the results and the implications of this paper. It sounds like we have a range of scores here. Would the assigned reviewers like to address any of the issues of rigor of prior research? Yes, well, I did see the comments and critiques and went back to look at those papers, especially that key paper. I think the PI's hypothesis is still based on scientifically rigorous arguments. Even if there are some concerns, this experienced PI team will be able to address the issues and move forward based upon the pitfalls and backup strategies they outlined in their proposal. Well, I have to say that I respectfully disagree with your assessment. Well, it appears that the reviewers could not come to a consensus, which they absolutely do not have to do. So to summarize the discussion, the application aims to study the effects of cognitive behavioral treatment on opioid use disorders, the rationale for this study is based on a recent paper that may indicate beneficial effects of a longer therapy session. However, the reviewers do not all agree on the interpretation of the results of this paper and how much they support the hypothesis of this application. Thus, the enthusiasm of the assigned reviewers appears to vary widely for the application. Can we have the final scores? I will stick with a three. And I will stick with my six. And I will give a three. Does anyone wish to vote outside of the range of three to six? Hearing none, we have, it seems, two differing opinions on this application. So the reviewers can vote their conscience, but you do not have to score the average of the range. Rather, you can score with whomever you are convinced the most by. And there we have it, third and final application of the day. Uh, time to open up for some Q&A. We got questions, we got answers. If you're a nun, I'd like to hand things off to Dr. Baugh to discuss the NIH's early career program. I have a slide that goes along with it. All right. So um, firstly, thank you everyone for participating and uh, doing such a great job with our mock uh, peer review panel. If you do not feel like this was uh, enough exposure to the NIH peer review process for you to have a great handle um, on uh, how the uh, actual reviews go, um, there is this thing called the Early Career Review Program at NIH. So the purpose of the program is to develop early career scientists um, by getting them exposure to the competitive grant application process through firsthand experience with peer review and also to enrich and diversify CSRs. So the uh, body of NIH that conducts scientific reviews 
pool of trained reviewers. So NIH, the way that they handle reviews, as you may or may not know, is um, typically the individuals reviewing grants are people that have been successful within that study section or within that body of NIH previously. Um, it's one of the things that you're sort of uh, I don't want to say guilted into, but sort of guilted into where, you know, you get your R01 and coincidentally, a few months later, you get an email um, from NIH saying, oh, hey, we just happen to need a reviewer for the study section. Um, now that you have experience with it, would you like to come on board? Um, which is, you know, an understandable way that they go about doing it. It ensures that individuals that are reviewing grants um, do have firsthand experience with the granting process and are clearly good enough at it to get their grant funded. Um, but what that means for early career investigators is they're sort of shut out of that mechanism. You know, you don't get the opportunity to participate in, in a review panel until you've had success. Once you've had a success, you probably don't really need as much exposure to the peer review panel because you've been successful. Um, so NIH recognizes the sort of contradictory nature of that. So created what's known as the Early Career Reviewer Program. So this is something that you actually apply to with NIH. Uh, and I'm sure Christian can send around the link for the uh, website to do this. Um, and what happens is um, you uh, fill out this web-based form and send it off. And if everything at NIH works the way that it's supposed to, at some point you'll be contacted by um, a study section where they'll say, oh, hey, it, uh, we noticed that you were um, applying for the early career review program and your application was accepted and we have an opening on this study section. Are you available? And um, you are treated pretty much like a standard um, ad hoc member of the review panel. Um, you typically have fewer grants that are assigned to you than a, a standing member or other ad hoc members with a lot of experience. Um, but you will be assigned some to review. You will be assigned um, one as primary. So you're the reader um, and do that whole introduction. And it really gets you that exposure. Um, the uh, study panel, um, Typically, the SRO is going to spend a, a fair bit of time with you ahead of time, um, going over really exciting PowerPoints about the process and teaching you how to um, conduct your, uh, your review, what things you can do, what things you can't do, basically making sure that you're not going to do anything that embarrasses you and stuff study section. Um, I remember one time I was on study section and someone had, um, you know, when you're um, doing the uh, grant by grant process, you, know, you can't say anything about any of the grants coming up um, ahead of time because uh, you haven't checked for conflicts of interest yet. And uh, I was on a study section where someone had said, oh, well, I'm going to recuse myself, you know, three grants down um, and uh, said something about one of the grants in between. And the uh, SRO, um, you know, pick that up straight away and said, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, shut up. You're going to invalidate the review process because someone on the grants in between may be in conflict. And if you start talking about it, it causes problems. So um, basically, uh, when you do the ECR program, they'll tell you all of the things that you can't do to make sure you're not that person um, that gets chastised in front of the study section, um, which obviously would not be nice. Uh, but the primary goal really is to just get you that firsthand experience. Um, it was something that I did early on and really enjoyed it. Um, it is uh, now is probably a better time to do it since uh, in-person panels are starting back up. Uh, if you had to do it during the, the Zoom reviews, I don't think it would have been as good an, as, of an experience. But now that they're starting back in-person reviews, um, I think it would be worthwhile. So if you don't have... Um, experience with the NIH review process and you're considered early career according to NIH's definitions, which typically means you haven't had an R01 or similar level funding um, as a PI, you can certainly sign up for this and um, yeah, uh, get some experience with this uh, firsthand so you don't have to rely solely on this group's wonderful acting abilities um, to find out what it is uh, about uh, or what the peer review process is all about. Uh, Christian, that sort of cover what you wanted to, to learn about the ECR program? Precisely. Uh, thank you for that uh, explanation, Dr. Vaughn. Uh, anyone have any questions? We have answers. 
Otherwise, I myself would like to thank all of today's performers for coming out today. Uh, I'm more or less the leader of all this and the organizer, and it is impossible without all the Dakota staff and awardees that you see today. So from me to all of them, I'd like to thank you all for coming out. Uh, we do have a question in chat. Can PhD students apply for ECR? Uh, no, they cannot. So this has to be early stage investigators holding um, typically an academic appointment um, or a, civil, a similar uh, position in private industry at the assistant professor level, um, sometimes associate, but uh, primarily they're looking for assistant professors. But good question. Uh, any other questions? Once and we went twice and sold. Again, I'd like to thank you all for coming out. Uh, this will be available uh, in the near future on the Pathfinder training portal. I'll send out links to that uh, at some point today. Other than that, thanks again and have a great Taco Tuesday. Thank you for putting this all together, Christian. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. Have a great day. You too.